welcome to the class, and we're going to try to have a very interesting discussion today. Um, we're going to talk about something very interesting, which is why uh, recommendations are a particularly interesting application for artificial intelligence, and especially how brain-based learning algorithms are poised to really accelerate and change the game for recommendations. Andrew Eng and his Coursera uh, class made a really interesting point, which is that uh, when he asks people in Silicon Valley, when he goes from company to company, what are your most important applications in machine learning uh, that you would most like to get an improvement of? One of the most frequent answers that he receives is that they're trying to build better recommendation systems. And yet, uh, within academic machine learning, the problem of recommender systems receives relatively little attention. It's very important work being done, but when you compare it to the image recognition and some of the other things that have captivated the neural network communities and other groups or language, um, recommenders is a smaller area as, as far as um, membership and progress. Um, so that may be about to change given the commercial importance of uh, machine, machine learning for recommendations. Um, just as you know, there's been a lot of breakthrough in the games domain and games are a very exciting area for AI because they allow you to really connect raw data and strategy to uh, actions. It's kind of the full stack of cognition. Uh, recommendations and decision AI offer the same promise. And what's interesting about them is that just like with games, it's going to let us connect perception challenges of AI to those of cognition and action. Um, but also, unlike games, it actually has a commercial justification and thus the potential for alternate funding sources to drive development. Um, and that's already being borne out partially. Um, but also, there's now highly structured data sets and goals and very rigorous arenas for success and codified metrics by which you have to perform uh, to win at the game of recommendations. And so it kind of has a lot of the attributes of games um, for driving AI, but um, a lot's on the line now, increasingly with these computer systems. Um, especially as, by the way, um, the applications of, of recommendations go beyond commerce to uh, you know, military, uh, medical, and, and strategic decisions. Um, so the need for recommendation AI will only increase if you look at the arrows of history. Um, a lot of our technology has been geared towards connecting and collecting information and then organizing for access. And kind of and the current chapter now is once we have all this information in one place, how are we going to attend to it and decide what to do um, and what actions to take based on that information? So that's where, again, recommendations are going to become more important. So the goal of everything that we're doing in AI for recommendations is of course to learn mappings between users and content or um, very various things that inform the decisions um, and connect that to future decisions and future recommendations. And just as in our heads, um, we find ourselves with our brain networks equipped to ask what is related to this, uh, what is similar, what is missing, and what will happen next, prediction. Um, similar uh, structures are going to be needed to make sense of data for recommendations in this way. Um, so what I'm going to do in the talk is give you a really nice catalog of all, I think, the network forms that I can think of that exist that are kind of brain-based or coming out of a brain um, uh, history that are being applied for recommendations and decision AI. And I think this might be one of the only compendiums available um, because when I was trying to put it together, I couldn't find any good sources that really take existing neural network-based approaches or, or the ilk and, and try to really define how you would use these for recommendations as a taxonomy. And so I've tried to prepare that for you today and I hope you find it interesting. So um, as a primer and an orientation, you really can think of a, a lot of the intelligence systems that we've done in computation as really trying to understand connections between data. So whether that's a database schema, a, a matrix with indices, um, a neural network, or indeed our own brain structures. It's all about building and maintaining connections and the weights between those connections that govern um, how information will flow through it. So recommendations started um, very much based and grounded in matrix um, processes, and that continues to be one of the leading methodologies for understanding, you know, when you can set the, the cells within the matrix effectively and factorize relations between users and items, um, you can make very strong predictions and very time-efficient predictions about what to recommend to someone or what to predict they would like. And so what we're going to do with this talk is just um, take that same matrix form, extend it to the network view, where if you just um, think of it as a network, you then begin to inherit all of the network um, paradigms that have developed for learning and weights effectively, and that can capture, say, nonlinearities um, between the inputs and outputs in ways that matrix um, 
processes may be harder to do, although, of course, semantically, it's all equivalent in the end. It's just a conceptual orientation and being able to utilize uh, programming frameworks. Um, so another thing to mention is that within the field of recommendations, the goal is um, to learn mappings, not just from items to items, but often users to users, items to items, attributes to items, items to attributes to an attribute recommendation. And so um, you really want to think of it as being able to cultivate connections of all these different types, because sometimes you may need um, bridges from items to users to understand the next items. And it's whenever you can make um, bridges from one to the other, it helps you um, identify predictions in the other uh, domain. So what we're trying to create is networks that will allow us to, when given a query like this, um, hey, I'm in New York City, I want a restaurant to eat at, similar to me, kind of like L'Espalier back home, but today I feel like Italian, and let's put it on the water um, as a nice to have. Um, we want a network that can take these first class concepts that humans understand that can be conversationally provided or through gestures or through other means and activate these concepts in the network so that when you put them all in on user's own profile, it's going to activate other things in the network and bring back, um, because everything will eventually be currently connected, um, a final answer that's most connected to these attributes and items and profiles. And um, we'll just talk about some of the network forms that help you get closer to this, although, to my knowledge, no network exists that brings all these together into one, um, where you can just do this multi-mode query, although uh, we and other companies are working on that. Um, so what we're working on, and I think other people are working on, is as efficiently and automatically as possible, bring together all the items that you might recommend. In this case, here's a movie graph um, that's going to connect all the items and all the fine attributes using um, semantic and unstructured analysis to bring out many fine features that aren't available in structured data and connect those to the items as well. And importantly, learning the weights uh, between those items and attributes in order to make recommendations. So when you come in and say, I like this, this, and this, you can light up related things. And so what we're going to talk about now is network forms to help us learn these weights. So um, it is a taxonomy, so it's right to start with uh, the restricted Boltzmann machine, which is a very clean um, method of, it's a bipartite, bipartite network that lets you um, take what they call the visible layer, and let's call these the items um, that you might want to recommend. And in the recommendation context, we're going to map these, it's going to learn latent factors that connect to these items. So for example, um, it, by, by pairing um, the activation of user profiles that have sets of items across the visible layer, um, it can learn hidden layer um, latent factors that will tell us similarities between movies that are um, related in ways that are um, not easy to express in English. But what's interesting about it is then you can play partial user profiles into this network. It'll activate the hand layer and then backwards activate other items in the visible layer with weights and basically fill in um, missing values um, in a way that is, is very similar to collaborative filtering. And what I've done for each of the uh, network forms in this taxonomy, I've tried to put a seminal paper um, for you to learn more about in the bottom right. Um, so you can then go and see how they've taken what's, you know, usually a, a well-established method for doing network computation and applied them to uh, recommendations for often the first time. So um, this was, you know, an important um, occasion in 2007 because it was one of the first times that they took RBMs over to recommendations. And then you'll, you'll see there's many network forms that are not been taken over. Um, an another good example is, you know, autoencoders. And autoencoders, of course, um, try to take inputs and map them to similar uh, domain outputs. So if you look on the bottom here, you see a shirt, which is a picture, or a, I think it's a shirt. Um, you, you put that into the network and it's going to reconstruct basically the same form as the, as the input. Um, it's trying to recapitulate the input through a process of encoding and decoding. So for recommendations, the equivalent would be putting in, a, again, a set of items and getting back a set of items that you would um, like to predict, again, using encoding and decoding. Um, so this is now starting to be done, um, including with deep learning um, with multiple layers and including with putting side information where you're not just putting in items and getting back items, but you're able to co-activate it with side information, um, such as attribute information or user profile information. Um, so this is a very promising method for um, being able to map 
um, an, an incoming user could come in with a brand new set of items and it would activate the, the weighted activation of all the items that you might recommend for that person. Um, Bayesian approaches are arguably related to um, brain. A lot of people think the brain is a Bayesian process. Um, so just as Bayesian networks allow us to start to disentangle causality and uh, make predictions, uh, we can use these similar um, methodologies to um, through things like message passing, expectation propagation, um, you know, belief propagation, um, build weighted connections between concepts and items again. And um, a good example of this has been pioneered by Microsoft in the fun way, um, but there are many others doing this, and we ourselves are doing this to start to infer um, attributes to, to movies uh, based on uh, their predictive power for user profiles. Um, heavy in networks, this is one that's not widely used in recommendations, but it could be very powerful. The, interestingly, in, in neuroscience, the heavy model is probably still the dominant model of how systems learn or are believed to learn in the brain. Uh, so you see here a schematic where a puff of air is given to the eye and that activates one neuron um, at about the same time that a tone is played, um, which is received by a neuron in the auditory system. And then there's a downstream neuron that will pair these two stimuli and start to associate them um, on its surface. And what's interesting about this is this is a learning network with no back propagation, um, no uh, supervised signal. It's all you know, learning from many small interactions happening. It's, these are pairs of neurons deciding, hey, we have mutual information. Um, and through associations being learned all over the network, and in fact, all over the brain over time, organizations arising in a bottom-up fashion. So you can imagine a case where um, a keyword is mentioned at the same time as a movie and you build a stronger association between that keyword and that movie, or um, a purchase of this item is, is paired with a purchase of this item and that builds a slight association between these two items. And through a bottom-up interaction, um, you could build a, a very resilient network. And this is believed to confer resilience and also generalization to new contexts. Um, so there's hope out there that this might be in addition to a lot of the deep learning work going on, a way to um, enable inference with much less training data, um, and also in a way that might be able to benefit from some of the work going on in uh, neuroscience. Um, so let's talk about deep learning networks as well. Um, deep learning, of course, is all about learning mappings from very primary data, such as pixels that you see at the bottom of the network, um, to high-level concepts. Um, if you take it a vision network. So the, the idea is that along the way of learning these representations, um, you're going to learn intermediate representations as in the middle three layers where interesting properties emerge in the system where not only are you encoding the pixels in the bottom explicitly, but you start to derive these higher level concepts like edges start to arise in the network, the recognition of contours, um, the recognition of object parts that then give rise to the final object at the top. Um, and so this is again, a very brain, um, inspired approach, um, because we know that in the visual system, there's the same sort of emergent um, topography at different levels of visual processing. Um, but this could allow um, the computer to build complex concepts out of simpler concepts. And for recommendations, there's a lot of interest in this because you could imagine um, you know, going beyond the, the concept of the label, such as this is an action movie, because you might have a Celeste Stallone action movie that's very different than a Jackie Chan action movie. And so being able to recognize the sort of um, subshades of action movies can be something that network could automatically uh, start to isolate and then use those composably um, to enable um, better recognition of what the user might be looking for. Uh, so I'll also just mention um, work being done, uh, very, very promising. Really, the, it's exponential, the work coming out if you look at the recommendation systems, the ACM recommendation systems conference, uh, the deep learning workshop has gotten more and more submissions and um, more, better and better results. Um, this is one uh, out of Google where they're really looking at um, wide and deep networks. And so being able to um, combine uh, continuous features, categorical features, and even some hand-coded features um, along with you know, embeddings uh, that can take uh, features further um, and putting them all together with a, jointly trained system. So this is not an ensemble system, I believe, but a, a jointly trained system. And this is um, allowing for um, recommendations so that you could have 
just a subset of these factors. You could have only some user demographics, or you could only have um, what you know about how the users using apps on their device. And this was, I believe, to um, recommend uh, for the Google Play Store uh, which apps to recommend to someone. So it's just a subset of any of this information that gracefully is able to um, make use of what it's learned from users and other sets of information to make uh, very effective app recommendations. Um, and so what this arises when you take these deep learning models is you've got um, user data, you have um, how the user uses the items, and this is training data, which of course provides input to a model on the right. Um, but then you're also using this to generate more vocabulary um, about the data and you, you build embeddings and uh, secondary networks uh, off of these primary data sets and use these as input to the model as well. And then eventually this makes its way into a real time um, recommendation engine because the model is trained and it can be uh, provided to the production system. So uh, here, here's a, another, uh, another one out of the same conference actually where, um, again, they're, they're making very good use of both the integration of um, very hard features and, and collaborative filtering type information. People who watch this also watch this, but also uh, embeddings uh, to make use of the language and the video signals that, that distinguish the things they're trying to recommend. This case, I believe, was for YouTube recommendations. And um, one thing they point out here is a lot of these deep learning methodologies um, it's important to subset the candidates available for recommendation because, you know, on something like YouTube, you've got millions of candidates you could recommend to someone, and it may be difficult to uh, score these in, in the time period needed. So um, it's important to do almost a very kind of a nearest neighbor candidate filtering ahead of time to determine what could be eligible for ranking. And once these are determined, they pass through candidate generation to the ranking system, and then the um, multi-mold network takes over to be able to um, process the recommendations for them more finely. And one thing that seems to be a recurring theme is that, um, you know, when, when you add more layers, what they call deep, um, the performance does go up. So there is some sort of um, intermediate information being captured in, by these middle layers that are these hidden layers that have been added. And then um, combining wide with deep is very effective too, where you do. Um, the linear features alongside the deep learning. Uh, this kind of echoes uh, um, a finding by Netflix, which is that, you know, certainly if you if you compare on the left raw popularity and without personalization, just give people what's most popular, that does very well. Um, but adding in knowledge of the ratings um, can allow you to distinguish what to recommend to people and make a significant difference. And look at the size of the access. Uh, access, it's a it's a big difference with the additional ratings, but then if you can do feature engineering and do optimization on those features, you get tremendous gain um, at the bottom there. And so this, this um, kind of raises an interesting point in the recommendations field, which is that you know a lot of the idea about deep learning is that you can just kind of let it sit on data and it will find the pattern and make the good recommendation with very little feature engineering. But recommendation still appears to be the art of doing um, substantial feature extraction and feature engineering um, to provide to these deep learning models. Um, so it, it may be different than vision and that vision is kind of a not a restricted domain, but it's a very um, ordered domain that you may be able to eventually just have an app that uh, learns from it and, and have, the, have the network really make use of the statistics of vision in a repeatable way uh, to generalize, whereas recommendations, because the domains are so different and um, people are so different in the way they use these applications, it may be important to transfer some of that knowledge to the features um, in a way that the network may not be able to learn by itself. Um, so another interesting uh, classification network, recurrent neural networks, um, RNNs are also being used for recommendations now. Um, I put some citations down at the bottom. Um, what, the reason these are useful, of course, is RNNs are great for sequence or uh, temporal relationships between things. So. On the left, you see a case um, where a paper has um, treated recommendations as a session-based problem, where over the course of someone's session on a website, um, they're trying to predict where they will go next. And they're, they're treating it as a temporal um, situation where, okay, they've gone here and they've done this. Um, what's the next thing that is likely to happen? What's the next item they're likely to enact with? Um, so they 
they reason that RNNs might be useful for capturing this sort of sequential information. And then similarly on the right, um, there's an interesting paper where they were able to uh, point out that when you think about a user interacting with a profile or interacting with a set of items, there's a lot of things that are intransient to the user that never change um, their, their core profile or how they are. Some of us never change <laughs> that often. Um, but then there's some things that change very quickly um, with very high temporal frequency. And so they, they found it useful to have a um, network set up that could exploit these different temporal frequencies of change and treat features with different periodicities um, with different uh, networks to do what they call multi-way deep learning, um, which is kind of interesting. So the idea to look at sequences of things and even sequences that happen in, and unfold at different speeds is a very interesting use of RNNs alongside deep learning. Um, Markov decision processes I thought would be good to include for completeness. Um, you know, when you think about a user as occupying a state in a recommendation network where they, they have a goal or they're, they're doing something, um, they've done a, a set of actions, it, it may be useful to try to encode the, the state transitions um, that will lead to the, the most predicted set of next actions um, and therefore the next state. And so um, this has been um, presaged early on for how to treat someone in a recommendation context. And this gave rise to um, a lot of the thinking now, of course, around reinforcement learning um, and, and how we get people someone traversing uh, a game, if you will, of, of trying to accomplish something and then the game trying to predict what they're going to do. So just like um, you can treat a human as an adversary when you're trying to beat them in the game as a computer, um, or in a video game like Atari, um, by trying to estimate the word to a selected path um, and therefore predict what the right move is. Um, similarly, you could, um, it's, it's being applied to recommendations by saying, okay, the game is, um, each time the user does something, it's now the system's turn to make a move. And the system's goal is to predict the user's next move by knowing what its previous moves were. So when the system can predict what the user is going to do next and does so accurately, the system gets a little reward. And when the system um, guesses what they're going to do and they do something else, the system loses reward. And so it's a, it's a way to train a system using some of the late, latest uh, reinforcement learning methods um, to try to teach it to um, anticipate the user correctly. And when it does so, it's won the game effectively. And that's a way to, just as you can take pixels and um, teach a computer to play a video game, you can take a user's context and teach them to use that cue, that set of cues to predict what the user is going to do next as a sort of game that the computer can also learn how to play. Um, unclear whether that's a promising approach yet, but you know, reinforcement learning is very exciting to many people right now, and therefore it's interesting to see it being applied to recommendations. So that's um, a quick taxonomy of brain-based network forms. Again, it's, it's hard to find all these put into one place as to how they're applied to recommendations. Um, but we would also be remiss if we didn't talk about brain-based networks that are being applied for developing data for recommendations. So this is not so much the algorithm for making the recommendations or making the match from a user to an item, but it's for cultivating features um, to make um, more understanding of the items or of the users. So um, just a quick taxonomy of those. Um, this is a, uh, a paper out of MIPS in 2013 that I think was applied by Spotify or an intern there as well, similar concepts where they, they're looking at the audio signals and trying to identify latent factors that unite music and distinguish music. So you see a chart of how these bands um, have been grouped based on the raw um, or, or their processed audio signatures. And you see you've got um, you know, people like uh, Kanye West in the upper left, and you can see some things that are clustered around Kanye West. Um, then you have, uh, what do we have? Chris Brown down in the lower left along with someone kind of R&B type sounds. And, um, and yeah, you got some rock in different quadrants. So uh, again, unclear whether this dramatically is going to, um, how, how effectively you can do this to change recommendations, but it's interesting to see emergent patterns starting to be derived about just from raw audio signals. And you can imagine if you had more principled ways of extracting those audio signals, you could maybe do some very interesting um, learning of relationships and um, also make embeddings. So on, on the concept of embeddings, this is um, a way that relationships and language are, of course, being uh, very effectively done to not only anticipate the sequence of what's going to come next, 
in a sentence um, of language, but also start to understand semantic relationships on the bottom. Um, so you see um, relations that have been plotted into space um, between words and how they relate. And even on the bottom right, um, predictive power where you can say, okay, what's the newspaper most associated with New York? And it will uncover New York Times, where you could say, uh, what is the and the team will associate with Detroit, and you'll find Detroit Pistons. Um, Steve Ballmer is related to Microsoft, Larry Page to Google, um, Werner Vogel's um, Amazon. So th these are ways that you can start to um, collapse very, um, you know, full information from text or language into very um, compact embeddings that could then be inputs to a network as well. Um, and the relationship information, of course, can connote similarity metrics that can be very useful for recommendations. So uh, we and others believe that when you do recommendations, it won't be, that there's a lot of interest. Um, we get asked a lot, well, what's your, what's your algorithm? How's your algorithm different or special? And we obviously put a lot of work into our algorithm for making matches or recommendations. But what we've learned is that to do effective recommendations requires integrated data processing um, and all kinds of, you know, standardization methods, resolution methods, um, uh, embedding extraction methods. You need to do so much with the data in order to even set stuff up for the recommendations that uh, it's almost pointless to have a disembodied algorithm. And more than 50% of our time goes into the, the data management, the data processing to set it up for a clean algorithmic um, drive. And the more automation that comes around these data tools that um, we're still trying to drive, and I think others is going to um, allow for more plug and play algorithms. So what you can imagine is an emerging recommendation stack uh, where you have perceptual AI that's doing, that's very hierarchical in nature and pulling out levels upon levels of features, um, going from more primary information like pixels to higher order concepts of what it sees in videos and sounds and experiences. And then these are being fed into cognitive systems that are very recurrent and um, connect concepts together where anything can connect to anything. And this seems to be what our brain does as well, where we have very hierarchical primary sensory systems then feeding into our massively recurrent cognitive system, our cortex at the top. So that, that's um, as much as time will allow a quick um, brain-based uh, foray into the side for developing data. And we talked really about the side for doing algorithmic matching. Um, but I'm just going to quickly touch on before the time expires, uh, current frontiers and recommendations, and then we'll leave about five minutes for questions. So um, a current frontier, as people have followed, well know, I'm sure, um, making networks interpretable. So with this march of um, techniques that let us do more and more inference at, at deeper and deeper levels, away from explicit representations, um, there's a returning call to make these networks interpretable again. And um, this is especially important as recommendations become more um, important in the domains they touch. So as they start, as we start to use automated systems for defense and for intelligence, um, DARPA has said, hey, we need explainable AI. It was just it was a call they put out. And um, the basic premise is if the traditional model of machine learning is we're going to train, pass training data, do a process and learn a function and give the recommendation to the user, um, we're going to need now that, that, that's going to be limited by the machine's inability to explain itself and how it's making decisions to the human users who need to know. Um, so they're calling for an expla explanation module or interface um, in between the learning process and the user so that they can understand why, understand why not, and know when to trust the machine or not. Um, very important for regulated and um, high intensity um, cognitive readiness. Um, similarly, we're, we're going to need better noise canceling mechanisms as the amount of data proliferates and the networks become more full. Um, it'll become more common to get saturation where you have winner take all situations. And while it's unclear how what form this will take, we do know that in our brains, um, an important aspect of fine processing, for example, when you push it on your skin, you activate a lot of area around the skin, and activation is a lot of what we're focusing on with building these networks and recommendations. But there's also um, inhibition mechanisms that sharpen and turn off the areas around the immediate activation to make a more fine um, perception of what's happening. So you really feel the center of the prick. Um, and so similarly, um, inhibition is going to sharpen the thoughts of computer systems, and it's going to come through um, mechanisms that are not well represented by AI networks currently, which is inhibitory um, networks that are going to 
um, sharpen and refine the processing as it flows through dynamically. Um, similarly, we need to go beyond metrics that sometimes hurt recommendations. Um, we all know about the filter bubble, the similarity hole. Um, once you see a Star Trek movie, you're gonna get more recommendations for Star Trek. Um, we need ways to discover out of that in a principled and safe manner. Um, and so similarly at a societal level, uh, we need it so that we don't have a winner take all network where everybody ends up following each other the same thing, again, discovering mechanisms. And of course, these are traditional problems. Um, TV had this problem, uh, the way we propagate information conversations had this problem. So recommendation algorithms actually could easily um, help us reach out beyond the status quo and provide the long tail um, level of interest to support uh, niche artists and niche content. Um, finally, we, we need ways to represent explicit knowledge um, on top of machine learning knowledge. Um, so this is a slide from Daphne Kohler at Stanford, really pointing out that as we learn these models that provide these algorithms to computer systems, um, we need ways to make those more declarative so that a domain expert can come in and say, hey, I'd like to edit that connection or I'd like to edit that concept inside the model, um, or I'd like to add data to that. And it's very unclear how, um, how you could have uh, the reconciliation of machine learning processes with human input um, uh, model uh, in the same place uh, without it being just a simple ensemble. But basically, if you could, um, you know, you have so much intelligence in the enterprise domain um, available, and if you could just let it flow into the machine learning model, that'd be amazing. Um, it, it helps because you can find a problem that the machine learning model made and, and fix it right in that moment or right in that place. Um, it's maintainable because you don't have to bring on the model and teach it the knowledge all over again. Um, but most of all, you get the buy-in because these people are um, working together with AI and they don't feel like it's just giving them an answer. They feel responsible for making it good. Um, so, you know, final thought, just uh, we have the promise to bring all of so much knowledge um, that's becoming increasingly available to computers, um, re return it, restore it to full availability to ourselves. And machine learning can help us to organize this knowledge, but it'll be important to keep it um, visible in a way. And so humans can understand these links and participate in um, defining these links too. And so it's a really exciting time to be involved in recommendations. This is the essence of decision-making and cognition um, unfolding in computer systems. And I hope you got some pointers, um, handles in the time allowed by which you can dig deeper into specific resources and specific ideas that might have sparked your interest. Um, so thank you again very much for for our listening, and I think uh, I, I hope you got something out of this that will now um, spark further questions. Okay, and I'm going to um, try to read through the comments and, and answer questions as thoroughly as possible. Um, the the bottommost question says, "Any thoughts or comments on evolutionary algorithms?" Um, I I do think that that's I would put that as if we talked about levels one and two, that would be level three, where um, my my PhD advisor actually used to say that. Um, the brain is a Darwinian system. Every cell is kind of a, a self-interested agent trying to capture connections um, that meet its goals, um, like an individual does in evolution. And uh, he, he was from China, but he would always say the brain was uh, capitalist and made a big deal out of the difference between capitalist brain and communist brain. And um, basically, yeah, I think if you could have a, a learning system that could evolve a representation um, in something akin to genetic algorithms, at the level of individual cells and how they recruit connections, that'd be very powerful. Um, okay, so um, can we share more thoughts on the XAI? Um, I, I'm not aware of, um, I, I, I don't know yet um, about successful use cases of XAI. Um, it, it is a hard problem for sure. Um, we, we found that when we, you know, when we sell AI systems to customers, they they like it a lot more when we, we, we include XAI in our systems. And so they it, it's much more easy for them to use when they have XAI. And they, they, we provide the reason alongside the recommendation, the reasoning chain. So you kind of back propagate through the network, get the reasons pulling forward. And um, that, that really helps adoption and, and buy-in. Um, so that's that that's a minor success, I guess. But um, we're, I think the jury still have to see if that compromises performance. Um, OK, and then backing through the questions, um, how is inhibition different than negative uh, or lower weights in a neural net? That's a great question. Um, we had a paper in Nature actually that talked about uh, a new kind of inhibition that in addition to subtracting or um, negating weights, like you mentioned, it does division um, where actually 
we, we measure the cells in the brain and how this happens. Um, there, there's a class of inhibitory cell in the brain whose whole job is to scale um, the representation up and down, almost like a volume knob where the whole graphic equalizer divides together. And if you subtract um, the signal of the network, if you think about a graphical equalizer, if you just chop off a few squares of each bar, it's going to distort the signal. But if you scale it divisively, um, you can actually preserve the signal and just change the amplitude of the whole network, um, the whole network vector. And so I, I think there's a role for inhibition that scales um, network vectors dynamically as information propagates through the network. Um, and that's this has been replicated by others now as happening in the brain, and it could have computational. Uh, yeah, you, you could consider like a bias. Yeah, that's a good point. Except that it ca it collects connections from the excitatory uh, features themselves. Um, okay, so then backing up, I, I want to make sure I go up to the um, the people up top too that asked questions earlier. How do we deal with old data that didn't have the feature, um, so that you don't have to re retrain? If you, if you add a new feature, how do you deal with um, things that lack that feature? That's actually a good question. I, I um, yeah, yeah, may, maybe um, someone on this discussion might have a better answer than me. That, I think that's a very good question. I need to think about that one. Can you address the cold start problem in current models? Yes, great question. So um, a, a huge problem with recommendations is, of course, you have such sparse data. Um, first of all, the user vector is very sparse usually. You, you usually, it's not like um, vision where you have these very rich um, images to draw from. You have like a few clicks from someone or a few points of interest. Moreover, um, what we find when we roll out AI to customers, they usually don't have any historical data. We, we always think, oh, we'll just get all this historical data and we'll train on it. But because they're AI applications, they're, they tend to be new. They tend to not have years of, of history, um, let alone months. So how do you learn without, um, in, in effectively a cold start situation where you don't have labeled data from users? And um, that, that's where I think the, the kind of bottom-up approach of networks is very promising, where you can start to build associations between related items um, purely independently of the user. And then when the user comes in, the first user says, I like this item, you've got a very rich network of what other um, items are similar. Um, so, it's, so it's really building an item-to-item -item network using attributes of the item that, that are uncovered by um, analyzing deeply reviews and, and um, structured data to really understand the items from different data sources. But once you have that, uh, to, to work hard to then um, build that connection so when the user arrives, you, you're not in a cold start situation. Most effective tools for improving recommendations. Um, it seems that the most uh, progress is being made by a, addressing the cold start um, because that just is such a heavy win. But then when you do have training data, it does seem like deep learning is starting to go beyond um, the current state of the art with the matrix methods for performance. So um, I anticipate that more widely available deep learning frameworks will help um, recommendation performance. And then are there any questions that um, we failed to address that have been asked? I want to be sensitive to the time, so I'm going to go to the keynote, uh, Sam Altman. But um, I, I just want to thank everybody for joining and um, really appreciate the chance to speak with you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Take care. Bye.